From across Southern Nevada to where you live, this is a special edition of News 13 Inside Las Vegas. A blood crisis in the valley. Doctors are canceling operations because the supply is critically low. I'm Mark Sayer. New talks are now scheduled in the ongoing cat bus strike. We're into week four. I'll have the latest in a live report. But our top story today, a Henderson man is attacked in his own home, tied up, blindfolded, and then robbed. A victim of a home invasion, and now police need your help in finding the suspects. Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Ray. And I'm Ross Becker. Welcome to our special hour-long edition of News 13. It's coming up right now before the Stanley Cup hockey game. Well, this robbery happened just after 7 this morning in a neighborhood near Silver Springs and Green Valley Parkway. News 13's Tiffany Sargent joins us now from the newsroom with the latest on the investigation. Tiffany. Yes, police say they do have several leads right now, but right now they are looking for two suspects, two male suspects on the run in what is believed to be a stolen car. Yellow tape surrounds this Henderson home near Silver Springs Road, where police say a man who was home alone became the latest victim of home invasion. It all started with a knock at the door. He wasn't going to answer the door, but as he was walking away from the front door, um, he was kicked in by the suspects. He ran, uh, got about halfway up the stairs before he was tackled by them, at which time he was tied up with uh, tape and other items in the house, as well as some handcuffs. Um, uh, t tape was placed over his eyes, as well as a pillowcase, so he couldn't see the, the suspects in this case. It's shocking news for longtime residents who live nearby. And I just came out this morning and seen all this and everything and didn't know what was going on because our neighborhood is so quiet. Police say aside from being traumatized, the victim was not injured, and even though he cannot describe the two suspects, he says they did speak Spanish. Police say the suspects got away with many of the victim's personal belongings, all of his cash, his wallet, his ATM card, and PIN number. They also took the victim's car keys and left the scene in his 1991 Toyota MR2. The car has T-tops and a Nevada personal license plate reading 2CNNV. A part from the car left behind shows the black and red flaked color of the car. Meantime, police say these are items that can be replaced. Lives cannot. So in a situation like this, it's best to cooperate. There's nothing in your home, your car, or anything else that's worth your safety or your, or your health. So yeah, I would say that he did the right things because he's okay. Police also tell us so far there have been other home invasions uh, incidents in this, uh, in the, so far this year in Las Vegas and in Henderson, but they say there's no, at this time, they cannot tie uh, this case to any other case. So uh, we'll keep you updated on that. In the meantime, if you have any information concerning this case, you are urged to call Secret Witness. That number on your screen, 385-5555. Once again, 385-5555. For now, we're live in the newsroom. I'm Tiffany Sargent, News 13, inside Las Vegas. Well, he hit and he ran, and this afternoon, he's still running. Metro police are looking for a hit-and-run driver that killed an elderly man last night. Witnesses say the driver was swerving all over the road before he crashed into another car. An elderly man driving that car was killed, and his wife is critically injured. But instead of stopping, the driver and his passenger got out and ran. Police made a sweep of the neighborhood, but they vanished. Here's a description of one of them, the driver, a 200-pound man with a bushy mustache. Ross, it could be the death penalty for a Nevada teenager if prosecutors get their way. 16-year-old Guile Manley's indictment has been unsealed and he is facing 12 felony charges. They include carjacking, killing two people, and injuring an NHP trooper in May. Prosecutors say Nevada law allows the death penalty for defendants 16 or older. And the former DEA agent facing charges of soliciting sex from young boys appeared in court today. Stephen Kinney pleaded not guilty to 60 six charges. They range from attempted sexual assault to solicitation of a minor. Prosecutors say Kinney apparently wrote notes to young boys asking them to have sex with him for money. They say he then wrapped the notes around small rocks and dropped them at the boys' feet in local stores. His trial is set to begin the 4th of November. Well, this afternoon, our valley is facing a real medical emergency, and this time it has nothing to do with malpractice insurance. No, this is about the critical shortage of blood. There's only enough to supply our area for about one more day. News 13's Dave Malkoff live at UMC right now with the very latest. And Dave, this is serious. Oh yeah, Kathy. As you know, this right here, UMC, is the only level one trauma center in the area. But this is also the only place that's getting blood right now. 
all the hospitals in the area, 19 area hospitals, have to rely on just what they have on ice. This is a real medical crisis that can only be solved by blood donors. It's time again for Ben Allen to give blood. Moved to Las Vegas five years ago. It has uh, been my uh, policy to give blood wherever I live. There are more people in the valley like Ben. Our area wouldn't be in such an emergency right now. Can I cross my feet? Yes. Ben's been donating for 15 years. Uh, I think you would prefer the right one. See, he even knows which uh, vein is good. They never take out of the left. No, I think sometime we're, gonna, sometime we're going to have to switch, aren't we? <laughs> Just a few light squeezes, then it's down the tube and into the bag. Then it's ready for the refrigeration unit. This one refrigerator here services not just Clark County, but 19 area hospitals. Right here, you're looking at 30 units of blood. If there's a really bad accident, they might have to use all this blood for just that one accident. We have, for example, the two serious automobile accidents involving a forklift and then another one with a motorcycle accident. That was 100 units just for two victims. There's simply not enough blood in the fridge. Even if a hospital needs it, the blood bank can't spare any bags right now. They have to save all of this for trauma only. That's why they need more donors like Ben. Well, that was quick. Okay. And you know, now that you know how easy it is, the United Blood Services is making it even easier. Tonight, they're staying open until 8 p.m. and then tomorrow and Saturday, they'll be open till five. Now, this is also rare because on this weekend, they're gonna be open on Sunday as well. They don't usually do that because this is such a great crisis. They are gonna be open on Sunday all throughout the weekend to collect blood donations. Dayton, I know that there are some parameters, but almost anyone can donate blood. Yeah, you, you have to be 17 years of age and you have to weigh uh, around 110 pounds or over just so you can withstand all that blood that you'll be losing. And there's also a screening process, but it's really easy. Basically, anyone can donate blood and they do need everyone to do it tonight. And it truly is a gift of life. It is. It is. Okay, Dave Malkoff reporting live. In Utah, police are getting some leads in their search for missing teenager Elizabeth Smart. The 14-year-old was taken from her Salt Lake City home last week. Investigators now suspect an extended family member may be involved. Police thought the abductor entered the home through a small window in the girl's bedroom, but the window screen was cut from the inside, not from the outside. Now detectives are taking a closer look at the Smart family itself. Mm -hmm. Well, we are well into week four of that cat bus strike, but today there could be some good news. Yeah, both sides say they are again ready to talk. News 13's Mark Sayer is at the Tompkins bus yard right now. Mark, uh, why now? What changed? Well, Ross, what happened apparently, Cat Bus says they received a call from the union last night. Both sides did meet in what they're calling exploratory talks last night. And we just learned moments ago that talks, indeed, full-scale negotiations did resume at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Here's what happened today at the meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission. In a strike where there has been very little good news for passengers, the bus company, or the government agency that oversees transportation, today there is this. Maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I think this can be resolved in the very near future. And for the first time, the Regional Transportation Commission is publicly explaining its hands-off approach to the strike. And we cannot, um, as the public agency contracting with uh, ATC, get involved actually on either side to the extent of putting any economic pressure and affecting negatively the bargaining positions of either labor or ATC Vancom. The RTC cites a U.S. Supreme Court decision which punished the city of Los Angeles to the tune of $14 million for getting involved in a similar strike. But the RTC's top man concedes that's no comfort to passengers. We have been dealing with the challenge of individuals who have been late to work, who have lost their jobs, who are waiting extended periods of time out in the heat. Striking drivers say they are encouraged that both sides are at least talking again. I'm doing good. Uh, we're all doing pretty good. We're real hopeful. Uh, strikes, of course, hurts everybody, the striker and the company. But in this particular case, uh, we didn't have much of a choice. 
Back here to a live picture now. Uh, the strike activity definitely picking up when the television cameras are on. No question about that. The RTC did release some new statistics today on what's been happening over the last month. Let me read them to you. The lowest level of bus service we ever had in the past uh, four weeks was 41 percent. The service has been as high, however, as 91 percent. That's what the levels were last week, the third week of the strike. That is the latest now from the Tompkins Bus Yard. I'm Mark Sayer reporting live. News 13 inside Las Vegas. Mark, these two sides have taken this all the way to a ratification vote at one point. Any reason to be hopeful? Hopeful with this new round of negotiations? Well, Ross, with the phone call we just received, uh, yes, hopeful indeed, because as things were left last night, there was no guarantee the two sides were going to talk. But once again, both sides did resume formal negotiations at 1 o'clock this afternoon, talking again for the first time in two weeks. Of course, we'll keep you posted, let you know if we hear anything. All right, Mark Sarah reporting live, the latest on the cat bus strike. Thanks. And uh, speaking of hopeful, winds from the north are helping to slow down that large fire now headed toward Denver. Fire crews say they're encouraged because the fire, though it's still growing, is moving at a much slower rate. Hundreds of firefighters are trying to keep the flames away from houses there, so they're soaking the homes with water, chopping down trees, and digging fire lines for backfires. More than 20 homes have been destroyed so far, and thousands of people have been evacuated from their houses. In Utah, firefighters are gaining the upper hand on the big wash fire that's burning near Cedar City. The fire burned right up to Highway 14 there, so that highway is still closed to traffic. And there are still some evacuations of homes and businesses. But at this point, the fire is 70% contained. Fire crews expect to have the fire completely contained by Monday. More than 5,000 acres have burned there so far. Mm. There's a nasty virus striking kids at Valley Daycare Centers. Yeah, the health team's Heather Angel is going to take a look at the symptoms for you and just where this bug is popping up. And now that is one old cookie. Ooh. Oreo cookies are celebrating a milestone. But do you even know where the name comes from? We're going to show you. Oh, can't wait to find out about that. We're going to show you exactly where that Colorado fire is in relation to Denver and talk about your triple-digit temperatures in the forecast in a few minutes. All right, Nate, so uh, does the cell phone antenna booster really put an end to dropped calls? Contact 13 puts the booster antenna to the test. Up next. Team 13 and the Jefferson Awards are brought to you by Wells Fargo Bank. Now with more complete coverage, News 13 continues with Ross Becker, Kathy Ray, Nathan Tannenbaum with your complete forecast, Ron Futrell Sports, and Trisha Keen with Contact 13. This is News 13 inside Las Vegas. I don't know about you, but mine always rings just at the wrong moment, right? <laughs> cell phones, uh, they're an important part of our lives. They though. really are. Well, have you ever had an important cell phone conversation while driving? You shouldn't be doing that anyways, yeah. but you hit a bad cell area and all of a sudden the conversation just ends. Contact 13's Trisha Keen decided to put a popular cell phone antenna to the test so you can get right. rid of that problem. That's right. Well, you may have seen these cell phone antennas advertised on TV. Mm -hmm. And you really wonder, do they really work? Well, we put Rhino International's internal cell phone antenna to the test right here in the valley to see if it really does live up to its claims. The internal cell phone antenna, you may have seen it on TV. It claims to reduce static, work on any phone, and prevents those harmful electronic waves that enter your ear. In fact, the box says, it will improve your phone performance inside elevators, buildings, and tunnels. Like it says here, it's like having a four-foot antenna on your cell phone. That's a lot better than the uh, two inches that I have here. <laughs> Contact 13 asked Adam Kinzer, who relies on his cell phone every day, to test out the internal cell phone antenna. He applied it to his phone earpiece and mounted it inside the battery compartment. Adam works for Autoglass Solutions, a mobile company that keeps him on the road and on the phone. Bad okay. cell phone reception is a daily right. problem. It's a very distracting to my business uh, in order to uh, get things accomplished the way that uh, the customers would prefer them to have it done. First, Adam tried the antenna through the airport tunnel. No problems with it at all. The reception was fine. Next, Adam went into this building. Am I, am I breaking up? Not in the building, but when Adam stepped into the elevator... I've got a full signal, but I've actually lost him. Adam had to wait for service. But when he tried to make another call, again, no luck. It's not going to work out as well. Then it was off to a notoriously bad intersection for cell phone reception, Nellis in Washington. Adam made a call to his boss, Andrew. Adam found that for Andrew, the call was not clear. 
It is still breaking up a little bit. So here's how the Contact 13 product test shaped up overall. Adam doesn't buy all the strong claims made on the box, like the one that says it's like having a four-foot antenna on your phone. It, it, it does help out in some situations, but not all. So Adam says that it worked well enough that he would buy the product for his own phone. If you're interested in trying the cell phone antenna, Contact 13 bought it for $20 at Target. And finally, from Contact 13, our volunteers have helped our viewers fight their consumer battles. Now we need your help. Contact 13 needs two volunteers. So if you're available any day, Monday through Friday from these hours, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., give us a call. The number to call on your screen right now, 257-8333. Go ahead head and leave a message. We will call you back if we want to talk to they you. They can call right now. Yeah, right now they can call. So this right. is the deal. All pretty right. well overall, except for not in elevators. You okay. decide. Yes. Right. Thanks, Thanks, Trisha. Thanks a lot. Well, Nate Tannenbaum standing by right now. You know, beautiful day today. Normal. Just about as normal as Nate. Uh, well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly does that mean? <laughs> it has been a gorgeous day. We expect, if anything, tomorrow will be a degree or two warmer. Right behind me, hey, it is the Las Vegas Valley. A beautiful shot from our mountain cam. It is warm out there. We're at 100 degrees, and technically this is a couple of degrees above normal. Humidity is at 17%. Uh, There's a breeze now out of the northeast at 13. The barometer is falling at 29.83. And some other temperatures around. Yes, we're definitely busting triple digits just about everywhere. Laughlin's at 106 right now, uh, right at triple digits for Indian Springs. Mesquite's at 103 and 101 over the hump in prompt. Mount Charleston, 78, pretty warm, and everybody else in the mid and upper 90s. What do you say we uh, fly right back down in here into town and find out what's going on in your neighborhood right here in the metro area. Like down in Henderson, you guys are at 104 at this hour. A sunshiny sky, same thing for Nellis in 104. Up in North Las Vegas, you're not quite at triple digits at 99. 97 for Summerlin. We'll check it at the National Weather Service. And again, it appears to be warmer on the south and the eastern half of the city. Meantime, the day and temperatures around the southwest uh, started out in the low 50s in Denver. They're at 72 there right now, 90 in Grand Junction, and right at 100 in St. George, 105 in Phoenix. Also wanted to show you the satellite picture for the rest of the nation, a pretty strong low pressure system up over the northern and central plains, and severe thunderstorms over eastern Colorado yesterday have now blown into uh, the nation's midsection and down towards the south. But right now, there's not a whole lot of rain in the forecast for the uh, fire area there in Colorado. But I wanted to show you just if you live in the Denver area, you, you know some folks who live there, and you're very concerned. This right here is the Denver metro area, and here is what they're calling the Hayman Fire. There's about 20 to 25 miles in between where the fire is and the extreme southern reaches of the metro area. So it's really not encroaching onto Denver itself. And they're saying that the wind right now is coming from the north, so that is helping those firefighters as they battle nearly 100,000 acres on fire out that way. Well, let's head on back home, and we've got nothing like that to worry about. Maybe the lower 70s when you get up and at them on Friday with calm wind. During the day tomorrow, yeah, we'll inch it up at least a couple degrees at 104. Some neighborhoods, you might even be pushing 110 tomorrow, like Henderson, Green Valley. Southwest winds at times in the afternoon to only 20 miles an hour, really not that big a deal. As always, if you're looking for more weather information, we've always got it for you on the weather page of the Las Vegas Review Journal. In fact, tomorrow we're talking more about fighting those wildfires and the issues that the U.S. Forest Service is facing, uh, not just with this fire, but wildfires in general. And when we get back together on News 13 at 4.30 this afternoon, of course, we'll have the temperatures for your family and friends, and we'll have the Father's Day outlook as well, Ross and Kathy. Sounds right, thanks. great. Thanks, Nate. You know, it's one of the few snacks that your parents probably ate, and probably even your grandparents. Yeah, my grandparents probably still have some around. Uh, <laughs> today, Oreo cookies, you got them around, they're turning yeah. 90. The makers of the cookies celebrated with a birthday party at New York's Chelsea Market. That's where the first Oreo cookies rolled off the cookie presses. That's the old Nabisco building. But do you know where the sweet treats got their name? the RE in cream between the two O's in chocolate. Oh, I get it. But Oreos haven't become stale over the years. Of course, not different versions of the simple black and white cookies have popped up like mint and cream and peanut butter and chocolate Oreos. And they're mm. all delicious. You bet. Tried them all. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, uh, moving on, it is one of the leading causes of blindness here in the United States. But could preventing glaucoma be as easy as a few eye drops? The health team will show you.
But first, a new discovery about cancer genes may be the key for future treatment. We're going to have more from the health team when this special edition of News 13 at 4 continues. Now, with more complete coverage, News 13 continues with the health team. And from the health team, doctors studying children's cancer cases are learning something about adult cancer. They are. They have found a cluster of genes related to breast cancer and a child anemia that often leads to cancer. Doctors think the six genes are involved in many cases of breast cancer. Researchers say the finding can eventually lead to family testing and more treatments. More from the health team. A new study shows simple eye drops can delay, even prevent glaucoma in some patients. Drops to reduce eye pressure for those with ocular hypertension have been found to reduce the risk of glaucoma. In a five-year study, glaucoma developed in about 4% of patients who got the daily eye drops, but it developed in about 9% of those not treated. However, not everyone with elevated eye pressure should get the eye drops, and side effects include permanent darkening of the eyelids. Well, right now in the valley, we're seeing a rash of the stomach flu or bug or virus, whatever you want to call it. But the experts say the real flu that's influenza was mild this past season. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says influenza cases peaked early in late February. And at that time, there were fewer cases than usual. There were flu vaccine shortages in some areas of the country, but the CDC says plenty of vaccine will be available next fall. And finally, from the health team, it's a sign of these dangerous times. The government is stockpiling anti-radiation pills in case of a nuclear strike. Now, federal agencies ordered 350,000 potassium iodide pills. They apparently protect the thyroid gland from radioactive iodine, which is released during a nuclear explosion. The experts say the pills wouldn't do much, however, against what they're calling a dirty bomb. Well, the plot of candidate David Parks versus <laughs> candidate David, David Parks, Parks thickens today. Mm -hmm. The real David Parks, the challenger, made his first public appearance today. Or, or did he? Well, we'll sort this out coming up. It's a highly contagious virus that mainly affects children. I'm Heather Angel. It's going around southern Nevada. We'll show you what it is. That story is coming up. From across Southern Nevada to where you live, this is a special edition of News 13 Inside Las Vegas. A California teacher suspected of having sex with her student asks a Clark County judge to let her out of jail. Children are getting sick. It's a respiratory virus making its way through daycare centers in the valley. Our health team has details. But first, a political mystery revealed. Or is it now more suspicious than ever? A challenger for Assembly Seat 41 says he has revealed himself. Mm. We've told you about a challenger for the seat who has the exact name as the incumbent. Welcome back <laughs> to this special edition of News 13. I'm Kathy Ray. And I'm Ross Becker. However, has anyone ever seen this incumbent, this, uh, this David Parks, the challenger, I guess. He's the challenger. Today, we might have seen David Parks. News 13's Sean Boyd is following obviously a confusing story. Sean, sort all of this out for us. Did he come forward or not? Well, we'll try to sort it out for you, but we'll get to that in just a second. Take a look at this. This is the David Parks campaign sign. It's right off of Flamingo, but you can see these things all over the district. Now, it may be as mysterious as the challenger himself, David Parks. Can you tell by looking at it which one it represents? Well, but what's more important here is that the question, does David Parks the challenger exist at all? Well, we talked to him today or did we? My name is David Parks. That's the name my parents gave me at birth. Until today, the public has neither seen nor heard from David Parks, Assembly 41 seat challenger. Flanked by Bella Harris, who claims to be Parks' place. landlord. I know David Parks. He's lived in my home for, since 1998, since the death of my grandson. He revealed his identity, reading from a prepared statement at a news conference this afternoon. I reside on Demet Drive in Las Vegas. From the beginning, incumbent David Parks claimed the challenger didn't live there in the district as the law requires to run for assembly. But that soon grew to speculation that the challenger didn't exist at all. He had never been seen in public and seemed to evade all attempted contact by the media. He claimed to be on the road and out of town as a software salesman. The fact that my work takes me out of state does not disqualify me as a candidate. The fact that I use a post office box does not preclude me from being a candidate. The fact that I don't have a Nevada driver's license does not preclude me from being a candidate. And most of all, the fact that I will win this race 
does not preclude me from being a candidate. But the mystery over who is David Park's challenger may now be more curious than ever. When asked to show a photo ID, he refused at the advice of his lawyer. He did, however, at our request, sign a statement testifying his identity. He says he won't disclose any other details of his life because of, one, the threat of harassment. As far as a lot of my personal life was concerned and my employers and, and uh, members of family, etc., that I wasn't, especially when, it, when this became an issue, that I was not going to put people in the spotlight here. And two, the candidacy challenged by David Parks' incumbent. The incumbent, David Parks, is trying to use the uh, district attorney's office to uh, have the court remove him from the ballot because he will not win otherwise. All right, well, there you go. And here we have a copy of the affidavit signed by a man by the name of James Ferentz. He is the man who filed the challenge of candidacy on behalf of David Parks, the incumbent. In it, it says, we can prove that David Parks, the challenger, does not reside at the address under which he filed for the office. This affidavit is now in the hands of the DA, and they will decide when and if the challenge will go through. Reporting live out here off of Flamingo, I'm Sean Boyd, News 13 Inside Las Vegas. I think my head is starting to explode here. So what, what, what is David Parks, the incumbent, saying about all of this confusion? Well, we tried to contact him today, and he would not return our calls. However, we did contact James Ferentz, the one uh, who filed that affidavit, and also he is the one who is running David Parks' incumbent's uh, can uh, his, his campaign. What they told us is they would not comment. They would not comment at all on today's uh, press conference. James Ferentz said that, uh, that he would, quote, not, he would not justify today's press conference with a response. That is what he told me today, and he told me I could quote him on that. Now, they'll be doing their talking in court. All right, Sean. Um, thank you. Thank You're you welcome. very much. Moving on, the California teacher, she wants to get out of jail. Remember, she's the one police say had sex with her student and then brought him here to Las Vegas? Tanya Haddon, her attorney, and some of her family members were in court today. The lawyer says she should be released on her own recognizance, or her bail should be reduced. Right now, it's set at $280,000. No decision on all of that today. It goes back to court next Wednesday. He's just 16 years old, but Giles Manley is facing the death penalty. Prosecutors say he went on a carjacking spree last month and killed two people and hurt a Nevada Highway Patrol officer. Manley is charged with 12 felony counts, and if convicted, Clark County prosecutors say they're going to ask for the death penalty. More from the health team tonight. It's an illness that might not make you sick, but it could hospitalize or even kill your little baby. It's called respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. Well, doctors in the Valley are seeing more cases of RSV. Last year, there were 35 reported cases in May, and so far this year, we've seen 68 cases. The health team's Heather Angel shows us why it's so important for parents to know about this. Well, the symptoms of RSV are very similar to those of a cold. Runny nose, fever, and coughing. It's spread easily through physical contact. RSV season usually runs from October to May, but doctors expect children in southern Nevada to get sick all the way through the summer. Bye. Let's go. Bye-bye. Before one-year-old Janelle House can come outside to play, having a medicine, good girl. She's stuck inside, getting treatment for respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. She was coughing profusely. The cough was very deep in her chest. And when it came on, it came on suddenly, and it came on hard. Janelle's mom, Gina House, thought her daughter just had a bad cold. It wasn't until I spoke with uh, one of the nurses at the daycare that she made me aware that there was an actual outbreak and an exposure of RSV. I'd never heard of it. I Doctors say RSV is a potentially deadly respiratory infection in babies. It's highly contagious and can spread rapidly in daycare centers. Doctors caught Janelle's infection early, but some children have to be hospitalized. It can cause a pneumonia-like condition and also almost like an asthma-like condition. A lot of these kids have a lot of trouble with their breathing. This time of year isn't typically RSV season, but doctors say because of the climate here in southern Nevada, we're still seeing cases of it. For some reason, we have cases sometimes even into August. House wants other parents to be aware of RSV so they can get their children proper medical attention. She was literally fighting for her breath of life, and I didn't realize it. I just thought, gosh, it's another cold, but it's a really bad one this time. 
There is no cure for RSV. The virus just has to run its course. Dr. Mish says if it's caught early, doctors can treat the symptoms and sometimes keep children from going to the hospital. There is an RSV vaccine. It's very expensive and doctors only give it to high-risk babies. The hope is an affordable vaccine may be available to all children in a few years. Kathy. Okay, Heather, thank you. Now, there are some simple ways you can try to prevent your child from getting RSV. Make sure that everybody, all people, wash their hands with soap and water before touching your baby. Try to keep other young children away. RSV is easily spread from child to child. And don't smoke near your baby. Exposure to tobacco smoke increases the risk of RSV illness. All right, a quick snapshot of our weather. We've had a great day again. Yes, mm -hmm. we're at triple digits officially, officially this time. Yeah. Uh, we're not setting any records, though, and I don't think we will be in the next couple of days, even though we're going to be further above normal. The record highs for this time of year are like 115, 116. Yeah. <gasps> so we're not going down that road. But we are going to be adding a few more degrees to where we are today. Right now, we're right around 100. Some neighborhoods are already at 104. Stratocam is looking down at the wave pool at Wet and Wild. Certainly a lot of folks cooling off. Right now, we are right at the century mark. Humidity is 17%. A little breeze coming out of the northeast at 13 miles an hour. The barometer continues to drop just a little bit at 29.83. And as the weather headline there says, it will be warmer tomorrow. Some neighborhoods may be pushing 110. You guys, we're thinking it'll be more like 105, mm -hmm. maybe 106 officially tomorrow. And we'll it's that's neat nice. to see that 100 up there. We're right at the century mark. Yeah. When you say 115, that scares me. Yeah, those are the records. We're not going there, and we'll have okay. the Friday forecast in a few minutes. Oh, thanks, Nate. Thanks, yeah. Nate. Well, the U.S. Conference of Bishops is underway right now in Dallas, and already some profound words from the leaders. I express the most profound apology to each of you who have suffered sexual abuse by a priest or another official of the church. More than 400 bishops, including Bishop Joseph Pepe from here in Las Vegas. Those who are active and retired, they're all attending the three-day event. Most of the meetings will focus on the current crisis with the overwhelming number of sexual abuse cases and allegations hovering over the Catholic Church right now. We did not go far enough to ensure that every child and minor was safe from sexual abuse. Rightfully, the faithful are questioning why we fail to take the necessary steps. Now, bishops are expected to approve a policy dealing with the sexual abuse within the priesthood. About 285 are able to vote, not the entire 400 who are attending the conference. Well, it is confirmed now. The bone found Monday at Rock Creek Park is Chandra Levy's. The bone was found less than 200 feet from where her other remains were found last month. The D.C. medical examiner says most of Levy's bones are now recovered, but there are still a few missing. Levy disappeared last year after finishing her internship in the nation's capital. Prosecutors think a series of telephone calls may help convict David Westerfield. He's on trial for kidnapping and murdering Danielle Van Dam. Prosecutors want a cell phone company to release phone records because they could show where Westerfield was the weekend Danielle disappeared. But Westerfield's defense team says the calls are not a reliable record of his whereabouts that weekend. He is facing the death penalty if he's convicted. Terrorist suspect Zacharias Musawi will get to represent himself in court. He arrived under very tight security in Alexandria, Virginia this morning. Now, even though the judge approved Musawi's request, there will be restrictions. For example, it's unlikely Musawi will be able to review documents relating to airport security. He's suspected of being the 20th hijacker in the September 11th attacks. Musawi denies any involvement. A major national drug operation has been shut down. Federal officials in Los Angeles made that announcement today. The drug trafficking network is linked to Mexico's Ariano Felix gang. Now, that's the largest illegal drug operation in Mexico. Arrests were made in Southern California, New York, Arizona, Minnesota, as well as Connecticut. Cancun is the spring break destination, we're told, of choice for young folks Seeking, I guess it's pretty wild down there. I guess it is, but the uh, people living there want the boozing and the wet t-shirt contest to, to stop. We're going to show you how ahead. And finding a job is certainly tough. Now imagine conducting a job hunt when you're homeless. But there is a place the homeless can get job help.
Finding a good job can uh, be a challenge, but if you're homeless, well, it's even more difficult, of course. Without a permanent address or yeah. a phone number, employers usually won't look twice. But as Team 13's Christine Chang shows us, there is a place where those in need can get help. And they're open Monday through Friday, right? It's a place that can help people struggling get back on their feet. From making copies of resumes to surfing online for jobs, the MASH Village Resource Center has helped hundreds of homeless people get back on track. People like Earl Arnold. And their message service has been most vital because that I can have all of my message from uh, prospective job employers, call leave messages here, and that has been a great asset to me. Earl has been using the facility for about six months. The services are free. Nine o'clock. So is the help from the volunteers. There are hundreds of people who are really, really trying to get work. Mary Kelly has helped thousands of homeless people here. She says volunteering has taught her something too, patience. And I still have that problem with all of the wonderful things I have in my life. I, you know, I should have it now, and isn't it terrible? I don't, but I come down here and see what other people do not have. And I realize over and over every day what I do have. Mary hopes more people will volunteer at the center. She says there's a stereotype on the homeless, and it's one that Earl would like to break. Until I was put in this situation, I guess I was under that same mentality too, because that is what you read. But there are a lot of homeless people I know that uh, don't want to be homeless. For Team 13, I'm Christine Chang, News 13, inside Las Vegas. A MASH ended its contract with the city and plans to leave Las Vegas, but the Resource Center will be open until October, so it still needs volunteers right now. If you'd like to help out, give our Team 13 hotline a call. The number's right there. It's easy. 733-TEAM. A wildfire in Cedar City, Utah, is still burning tonight, uh, but firefighters have about 70% of it contained. So far, the Big Wash Fire, as it's called, scorched more than 5,000 acres. The Bureau of Land Management says they hope to have the fire fully contained by Monday. Highway 14, though, is still closed to traffic, and 30 homes are evacuated. The wildfire burning in Colorado is now nearly 100,000 acres. U.S. Forest Service officials say firefighters could be working on it, until the end of the summer, trying to contain what they're calling the Hayman Fire. High winds are expected to kick up today near one of the corners of that blaze, and unfortunately, that could mean mm. more evacuations. We're talking about weather. Let's head back over to Nate, who's here now with the extended forecast. It's a holiday weekend, kind of. Mm. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Father's Day. People want to know what's going on. Can they do that barbecue outdoors? Can you head out to Wet n Wild and not worry about wind? Stratocam looking down on Wet n Wild. It is going to be a great night ahead. We are right at the century mark at the top of the 4 o'clock hour. Humidity, 17%. We are seeing a little breeze out of the northeast at 13. The barometer is falling just a little bit to 9.83. And the official numbers from today, yeah, here you see the normal high. We should be topping it out right around 100. We're obviously a degree or two above that. Uh, the normal low would be 71. We started out at 70 this morning, and we've been to 101 so far here at the News 13 Weather Center. But there's the record, 114 back on 19 and 40. Sun doesn't go to bed till 2 minutes before 8, up at 523 tomorrow. And these numbers haven't changed in the past couple of days because we're getting near that summer solstice, which is uh, officially a week from tomorrow. Uh, summer begins on June 21st. Uh, checking the air quality for you, we do have a moderate reading of dust, and ozone is just barely in the good category, but I think we're hanging right in there. And let's check on those satellite pictures one more time for you. Not a whole heck of a lot going on. Again, there were some ferocious thunderstorms in eastern Colorado. That Hayman Fire is south and west of the Denver area on the west side of the Continental Divide. And as we look upstream, we are just hanging right in there. This low pressure system that we thought could be a factor later on in the weekend towards the first of next week appears to be kind of falling apart. Our area of high pressure remains very much in control. If anything, we'll be warming it up a couple more degrees here and then kind of holding at that plateau here for the next couple of days. Now, your family and friends across the nation, we've had some pretty hot stuff going on. 89s for both Atlanta and Raleigh-Durham, 105 right now in Phoenix. But we don't have any severe thunderstorm watches popping up until later on this afternoon over eastern New Mexico, southwestern Texas, and pretty heavy rain over the upper Great Lakes, scattered showers over the nation's eastern one-third. But so far, the only watch boxes are those in Texas and New Mexico. 
Let's head on back home and do that neat cast for you. I think you're going to like tonight. Generally calm wind. You should wake up around 73 degrees. Just a great way to start a Friday. And then uh, during the day tomorrow, yeah, we'll poke it up another degree or two. We'll say officially 104, maybe 105. And again, some neighborhoods will be in the uh, reaches of 110. The UV index, again, is at a 10. That is in the very high category, so make sure you got the sunscreen on. And in the afternoon, we'll probably see a few more breezes than we've seen recently, but 20 mile an hour winds, we can handle that. Heading out to the lake, you'll be closer to 110 for sure. In the afternoon, the breezes will be to 20, and you're waking up around 80. Uh, speaking of 80, that's going to be pretty much the high temperature up on the mountain, maybe a few degrees better than that, but a cool start at 44. Now let's check out those five-day for, uh, forecast numbers for you. Hey, don't forget Flag Day on Friday at 104. Should be the same on Saturday with no, no wind to speak of. Father's Day, Sunday at 102. That's my father there. Mm -hmm. And then it might be breezy to 20 or 25 miles an hour on Monday or Tuesday. But again, that's certainly within the realm of uh, being able to handle it. That's lovely. It's fine. We're hanging right in there. Yeah. Picture perfect. Thanks hey, a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Well, spring breakers may have to find a new place to... Do they still get down? Get down and party? I believe they do. That's because Cancun, Mexico wants to clean up its image. Cancun is known for its booze cruises, wet t-shirt contests, and tequila all night long. And it wants to have now some tighter restrictions. Among them, banning drunks from bars and advertisements that promote drinking. Business leaders have signed a civility agreement calling for these changes. You ban drunks from bars. I'm yeah. not sure how you pull that off. I don't know, off. but they're going to try to do okay, it. Okay, good. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. the Stanley Cup could have a new home tonight. Ron's going to have a preview for <laughs> That's us. That's right. <laughs> and the hardware. There it is. Look at it. Returning to Los Angeles. Find out how the city plans to celebrate the Lakers championship. Sports <laughs> is next. Sports with Ron Futrell. Brought to you by the Desert Automotive Group and their 11 dealerships. Now, with more complete coverage, News 13 continues with Ron Futrell and the sports team. All right, this could be the night that the Cup returns to Detroit. Actually, the Cup's already in Detroit, but for it to stay there, the Red Wings need a win over Carolina tonight. We got chopper video of the Cup showing up. It's not our chopper, but a chopper in Detroit showing up. The game is coming up in about five minutes here on News 13, so you can check it all out. Detroit leads the series three games to one, so the Hurricanes need to make it happen tonight. We, we need to we need to bring our best game of the series, and uh, that's all we're really concentrating on right now. Is uh, just everyone uh, you know focuses on themselves to to play the best game that they can. Yeah. It's our first hockey interview we've run in a long time, isn't it? The Lakers are back in Title Town tonight. The plane arrived at LAX less than two hours ago. Kobe and Shaq are holding on to the hardware. Kobe was uh, holding on to the trophy for, for winning the NBA championship. They have a name for it, but right now I can't recall what it is. They, they should just call it the Lakers trophy. Shaq got his third straight MVP trophy. They can name that one after him right now. The victory parade is tomorrow morning beginning at 11 a.m. The celebration begins at City Hall. They're using 11 red double-decker buses for the parade tomorrow. 18 cannons will shower the crowd with 2,000 pounds of confetti, so I'm told. The USA needs at least a tie to move on to the second round of the World Cup. Scenarios, anybody? You want the scenario again? No, I'll just say they need at least a tie. They take on Poland. Set your alarm for early in the morning if you want to watch the match. 4.15 in the morning, the match begins on ESPN. Poland is playing better soccer right now, so they say. Uh, that's what I've heard. They, they, will, they will not be making the next round, though. Today, four teams advance to the round of 16. They are Brazil, Turkey, Mexico, and Italy are all moving on, and most likely the USA will be moving on tomorrow. Okay, if you want to win the U.S. Open this year, guess who you got to beat to do it. Any guesses? Mm, Any guesses? Tiger, Tiger Woods okay. is at the top of the leaderboard after round one. They're playing on one of the toughest courses ever at the Open. Beth Page State Park in New York. Tiger looks like he was missing that putt far right, but it looks like he knows what he's doing to get the birdie. Woods with four birdies and one bogey to finish at three under par. One stroke ahead of Sergio Garcia. Here's Phil Mickelson trying to make something good happen here. He finishes at even par. Oh, almost hit that one. He's tied for ninth. One local golfer, Ryan Moore, a freshman at UNLV, is six over par through 16 right. holes. They're still playing tournaments. So they he did qualify through the open process. He's an amateur playing there, well, and so we'll have good. an update on his score at 11. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. And before we go, and before the hockey game, of course, gets underway, we want to recap our top stories. Some good news today out of the four-week-old Can't Buzz strike. Both sides now say they are negotiating again. Last time union and ATC VanCom officials met formally was May 29th. Uh, Las Vegas is facing a crisis. Uh, it's a blood shortage. It's estimated there's only enough blood to supply the valley for one day. So United Blood Services is offering late night and weekend hours so more people can donate. 
A bizarre political story getting even weirder. A challenger for assembly seat 41 has the exact same name as the incumbent. Up until today, the challenger David Parks was really a bit of a mystery. Well, today he has come out of hiding, so he says. But the challenger David Parks did not provide any proof that he's who he claims he is. This, he says, from the advice of his attorney. All those stories. We have a programming note, of course, for you. The hockey game is next. Then there's a movie of Billy Graham's The Climb at 8 o'clock tonight. Then we have two episodes of Extra at 10, followed by News 13 at 11. Until then, have a great night. Write that all down? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got it? Okay. Hockey's first. Yeah. Hockey's Enjoy first. the hockey Coming game. Up next. Good night, everybody. Got it. Got it.